Okay, next speaker. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Karen Avenon. Hope I said that right. Karen moved to Jamestown in 1997 and lived in and around and above town until nine, or 2014. She lived in Gold Hill for a year, here we go, and currently <coughs> enjoys living near Gamble Gulch. Karen is the author of Rough Beauty, 40 Seasons of Mountain Living, a Colorado Book Award and Willa Award finalist. Please help me in welcoming Karen Avenon. talk here called Marlboro Woman, which is a little bit based on my book. Oh, don't get too close to the microphone. Okay, so um, uh, I have a chapter in my book called Marlboro Woman, which is kind of like this. Anyway, so um, when I moved to a wood stove heated cabin at 8,500 feet uh, to live by myself for 10 years uh, with my unbelievably handsome white husky Elvis, and if you buy my book, you can get his picture. Um, <laughs> The questions I was most often asked were, aren't you afraid? And aren't you lonely? And last, what are you doing hiding up there all by yourself? <laughs> now I just want to point out that no one asked these questions of a man. No one said to Ed Abbey, what are you doing out there in the desert? No one said to Henry David Thoreau, what are you doing in that cabin? Um, that's because our stories, our novels, our adventure stories, even our movies, are full of narratives about men who go it alone. That's the norm. Um, that's our heroic tale. And out here in the West, you know, we have a familiar story, and that's the lonesome cowboy who lives up on the horizon, right? We know who that guy is. And uh, he's a bit of a legend and a mythic hero, and a lot of a myth. Um, some of us call him the Marlboro Man. Uh, when I was young, so I've lived in the West all my life, when I was young, I was so hungry for stories of women who went it alone, <coughs> like the Marble Man, like John Wayne, like Ed Abbey. Um, where was my Huck Finn, I wondered, and where was my Call of the Wild? Um, and with one exception, and that was Anne LeBastille, and hopefully you know her book, Woods Woman. She uh, most famously, she lived in the Adirondacks in a remote, remote place, and she built her cabin by herself by floating the logs across a lake. She's canoeing with the logs, and she builds a cabin out there in the wild. And I was really inspired by that story, but that was the only one I could think of. So I had this, I wanted to be out there alone, and absent a role model, I landed on the Marlboro Man. I know he shills cigarettes, but that's who I landed on. So, um... <laughs> And I think a lot of us think of him, we think of stoic and he's isolate and he's super cool and he looks good in the cowboy hat. And um, we look up to him even though we know, we know better out here in the West. Cowboys live violent and dangerous lives. And we all know, we live in a mountain community, that um, the water and weather are the two great equalizers up here and no one really does it alone, even though we like to think we do. Um, so I fashioned this kind of cowgirl ethos after the Marlboro Man, and I made myself into what I would call, I'm calling in the book, a Marlboro Woman, which was the first title of my book, and they said no. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be the title. Um, and I embraced him actually out of necessity. I wanted to live this kind of big, epic life. I wanted to go out there alone. Um, and most importantly, really, I wanted to live you know, uh, untethered by the confines of gender. Now, being a Marlboro woman for me meant I could do it all by myself without anyone's help. And that logic was formed in growing up in the crucible, which is being a female in America. Um, seriously, 1973 was the first year a woman could get a credit card without her husband's signature. It's not that long ago. My mother, uh, was forced to step out of her Air Force career when she got pregnant with my older brother. 
Um, frailty and dependency are the stories that I was bred on. Um, that, you know, in my family, one of my brothers, he was going to be an astronaut, and the other brother was going to be a chemist. And what was I going to be, my dad said? I was going to be Miss America. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so failing that, I would certainly make someone a good wife someday. So my role was to be so, a, play a supporting role in someone's life. Um, and I didn't feel like, I didn't feel demure, I didn't feel weak. I mean, I, as a little kid, I licked the sidewalk after rain because I loved the taste of dirt. <laughs> I was the kind of kid I was. Um, so locating my place, you know, in the world was like, you know, like stuffing my two square hands into very slim cotton gloves. Um, and it was frustrating. So I was determined to find a landscape that fit me. Um, one that allowed me to experience my own strength unapologetically. So I began camping. I was all by myself, hiking all by myself, all over Colorado, Utah, Wyoming. Some of my friends thought that was really funny and they called me the lady explorer. My grandmother, oh my God, my grandmother acted as, as if she tasted something terrible. I was telling her about the time I spent in the valley of the sun and the moon and I was camping and I was 30 miles away from anyone and it was really an amazing experience. And uh, she said, oh honey, I don't know where you get this. <laughs> you know, as if I was like suddenly eating animal carcasses and wearing pelts. Right? So, um, so I did that and then eventually I moved to the mountains. I became a real outlier in the tradition of Mary Austin's walking woman who is a woman who legendarily walks off, her, literally, her name out into the desert. No one knows what her name is anymore. And I wanted to kind of be like that. So I want to say that, of course, I've lived everywhere in the mountains. Um, I've lived in tents and in tiny trailers and, um, and really in every single funky mountain cabin that there is. Um, you know the ones with sketchy electricity, don't use that outlet. And uh, I had one cabin that between the wall, you know, where the wall ended and the roof, there was plywood, just plywood, and, and nothing in between. This was a cabin at 8,500 feet. Um, that cabin also had a tree inside that, I don't know, held up a wall or something. Um, it also had a coal stove uh, that was converted to wood use that warmed the wall behind it a little too much so that my, my closet, which was behind that wall, got really warm and that's where all the mice slept. <laughs> I also lived in a historic Pony Express barn in Left Hand Canyon, where in the summertime I bathed in a shower bag outside, which was lovely, and in the wintertime I heated water and um, I sat in a stock tank in four inches of water and bathed myself. Um, that cabin didn't have any plumbing, I just, it had a hole out in the back and that's what I used. So, um, and I did it, you know, I did it because something in what me wanted really to live wild and alone. Um, I wanted to be outside the confines of society. I got too many message, messages about who I should be and so I just walked away. Um, partly the society told me that I was weak and partly it told me that I needed a man to survive. So eventually I moved to this cabin on uh, the top of Overland Mountain outside of Jamestown, Colorado. And you know, mountain living. I put up four cords of, winter, uh, of wood each winter. And I would shoot bear from my yard, you can read about it, uh, throwing chips at it, yelling, shoot, get out of here. Um, I, um, I had, the, that cabin was made of wood bricks. And so, uh, everywhere the blocks were put together, there was no mortar, there was just blocks. And then so there was little tiny cracks of light mm. would come in. And in the winter, of course, lots of cold air came in. <laughs> so I would walk around with a cock gun and try to seal up the thousands of cracks in that cabin. And uh, failing that, you know, one January I woke, you know in January when the air is so beautiful and it freezes and it's crystalline and it's like shimmery outside. <laughs> And I woke up to that air kind of like floating in on my face. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had ground squirrels and critters in the cabin. Of course, I was, we were threatened by wildfire many times. Um, and then there was the thousand year flood. Um, 
I took all these challenges, um, and I liked them. Um, they supported this kind of cowgirl ethos I thought that I needed to survive. Um, they said my heart was fierce, not faint, and they said I could do it all by myself. You know, and I did, and I was okay. Um, but then something happened. A shaft as solid as any, the trunk of any tree formed in me from living all those years alone. Um, it was a kind of certainty, a lesson in how to inhabit my own skin um, and believe in my right to take up space and my right to live unfettered by the sorts of messages that make little girls grow up into somebody they probably weren't meant to be. Um, but something happened. From that shaft grew some limbs. And in those limbs, I learned another way of being. Um, it was one not tied to kind of toughness or endurance or being stoic or even being alone. It was something that instead I learned from the seasons. Kind of, you know, this is the great thing about mountain living. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Winter, spring, summer, fall. It happens all, and it doesn't stop. Um, and I learned the art of surrender at the hands of nature. Um, the ebb and flow of seasons. And, and realizing, honestly, my smallness in the world. Uh, and from that, I kind of fashioned a new kind of resilience. And, and one that really involved embrace. So the first thing that happens is I get involved with my community in Jamestown, and I cause a little ruckus on the arts board. Because, um, you know, I, I, I don't really know how Netherland is, but Jamestown is like every guy plays guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Something I find to be really annoying. Um, and so uh, all of the Jamestown events were like, let's put on a show, let's sing. And I'm like, how about some poetry? Um, how about an art walk? So uh, I caused a little bit of a, a trouble, which pleased me immensely. Um, and I also fell in love. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so when I think of what it means to be a Marlboro woman, for me it means being the hero of my own story. Something all women need. It means really living wild, and what that means is being a woman who makes her own choices, um, despite what is expected, and who's unafraid to take her own path. And you know, while the Marlboro Man is kind of a myth and a legend that hasn't really helped the West, I actually think that the Marlboro Woman can. <laughs> because for women, a Marlboro Woman means, being a Marlboro Woman means saying yes to going out there by yourself. Being not afraid to go alone, wherever that is, um, and being your own hero. Most importantly, it means telling your story. Imagine how the world the landscape that we know would change if little girls grew up the way little, do, little boys do, with their stories represented everywhere in novels and adventure stories and on film. I, I just want you to think of the last movie that you saw or movies that you saw this year and how many stories, of, how many stories did you see that starred women who weren't hookers or who weren't looking for a man? There are not many. Um, that's the world I want to live in. So, you know, the world has changed a little bit from when I was born. Um, but it's still not enough for me. Every single day I meet a woman who doubts herself, particularly among, gosh, particularly among the first years I teach at CU. Um, they worry about whether they are, are cute enough, are they smart enough, do they have the right clothes, and believe it or not, some of them are still sent to college to look for a husband. Um, I'd like to hand every single one of them a metaphorical hat and the reins to a horse and say, get out there. <laughs> I really now understand uh, the lonesome cowboy not as a role model, really, but as a metaphor for learning to shuck off the kinds of messages that are heaped on women, for the heroic journey, for living an authentic life. He captured my imagination because, you know, he's part of the mythic West. And myth is the engine of the stories that we tell that give meaning to our lives. So I'm taking him back. And yet, that lonesome cowboy is not really enough. He was never big enough. To do that, he would have to contain an understanding of landscape that works on you whether you ask for it or not, as it did for me. 
The writer Gretel Ehrlich says, everything in nature constantly invites us to be what we are. Not who, what. On the most basic level, I was landscape too. In the end, after 10 years, I realized I wasn't the lonesome cowboy after all. But he sure helped me become the woman I am. Thank you.